Okay, I think we're Facebook ready. Okay. I guess not. It's still doing something. Yeah, we are live on Facebook now. Oh, all right. Okay. So, um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, um, good whatever time of the day it is for you. Um, we're now a global village, as they call it, and um, we're in different parts of the world. So I'm in Beijing. Um, my name is Kate, or you can call me Marcus. I, and I'm, I'm a Ghanaian in Beijing. How interesting is that then? Um, so the, it gets more interesting because I have Thomas here, who's a Zambian in South Africa. Um, so we have Francis, who's in Zambia, and Sister Jemima just joined us. She's in California. Azovo Menza um, is a pastor in Ghana. And um, so the beautiful thing about what happens on Bible Talk is that it's, it's kind of a picture of, um, I think, the church that God, Christ, created. Um, it's for people from all over the world. And it's always beautiful to see each other once we gather like this, knowing that um, there is something that brings us together, something that um, keeps us together also once we come together. And it is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his word, his word. Um, his word is how we know of him. And um, the more we get to know him and understand what he has revealed to us, the more we realize how much we, we need him and how dependent um, we are on him for our existence, whether we want to believe it um, or not. And so I, I'm especially excited that Bible Talk actually gives us that snapshot. It gives us that particular picture. And so we're grateful to be the vessel that God is using um, to reach to reach his people around the world. The amazing thing also is that the more we do this, the more we, we meet people who share the, um, not simply the faith, but our quest to maintain, to help maintain its sanctity. Um, you see, you will find that a very few people who are interested in, 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 in maintaining the pristine nature of the gospel, more people distorted than want to keep it the way God himself delivered it. And so that also excites us. Every time we meet people like that, um, that excites us. We've met a new person. Hopefully, we get a chance to talk about that. For being faithful to this course, um, thank you very much for making it what it is still becoming. Um, we don't really know where God is taking us, but we can see that he's doing something marvelous over here. And we're especially excited about that. So if you've been following us, um, that's for those who are not here you would notice that we've been studying the book of Matthew under a topic, um, the topic, No Ordinary Man, No Ordinary Man. And it's a study of the life and teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one um, who the Bible is actually about. Um, we've done three chapters already. We're going to the fourth today, and it promises to be more um, I don't want to say exciting, revealing, even more revealing than the previous chapters have been. But some of what we've learned in the last few chapters, in the three chapters that we've done, is actually interesting. And like I always say, um, it is one thing to think you read the Bible um, or you know what's in the Bible um, because you hear the stories all the time. It's another thing to sit down and to study it verse by verse like we're doing with this book of Matthew. Um, because what comes out to you are things that you typically would miss. Um, but to do it like this with fellow believers around the world also expands, you know, what you learn because people have views and different revelations that they get 
um, from scripture. Let me be careful that not necessarily different revelations, but they, they are angles that you may not see, you know, that others will see. And so that's one of the things that has actually made this um, Bible talk as rich as it has become. So in chapter one, we saw the birth of Christ. Um, Christ said he, God had already promised that he was going to come into the world. And we saw that happening, happening in chapter one. We saw the circumstances surrounding the birth of Christ. And then we saw the attempt to uncake, if you like, the, the mission um, for which he was coming into the world. And we know that no, there's only one entity whose mission it is to um, terminate everything or to destroy everything God is trying to do. And, and that will be Satan. And so he's made his attempt at stopping it by killing baby Jesus. He failed. Um, if you're a believer, then you already know that if there's anything that we can be sure of is Satan's failure. I think he himself knows that. Um, but he will always throw smokes around to confuse people and to make them think that he's gaining grounds when in fact he's sinking. What he wants is just a few people to sink with. And if there's something we can do about it, we're gonna share the word to make sure that people know what's happening so that they don't you know, go down with him unnecessarily. Um, so in the second chapter, we also saw the baptism. Did we? Okay, we've seen the baptism of Christ. We've, we've seen God come down um, during the baptism. Um, we've seen Christ submitting to John the Baptist and um, at the baptism. Um, we've seen his humility. We've seen, um, well, he hasn't done any miracles yet, but we've seen um, from when he was a child in, in the book of Luke, especially how um, he demonstrated the power of God, which was on him, even as a child. And so we know that God was, was always with him, but we saw God come down completely on him um, at the baptism. So now he's been baptized. Um, he's, he's ready to start his ministry. And from in chapter four, we're going to see how his life begins to unfold after that baptism. Um, it has a lot of drama and holds a lot of very valuable lessons for us as followers of Christ. And in my prayer that as we go through this particular chapter, our eyes will be opened, our ears will be opened, our hearts will be open to absorb what God is trying to communicate to us um, in this particular chapter. So without wasting much time, I will ask my sister Joy here to read for us chapter four of the book of Matthew. Joy, are you with us? I am, hello. Excellent. Okay, yeah. so would you please do us the honors? Okay. Matthew chapter four, the temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, 
on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Jesus begins his ministry. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was written through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first disciples. Now, as Jesus was walking by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Verse 23, ministry in Galilee. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demons, epileptics, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Once again, beautifully done. We thank you very much. Um, Sister Joy, uh, for such a blessing that you have been to this ministry. And um, so just by way of reminder, if you um, are able um, at all in any way to turn your camera on, even if it's just for a short while, um, it will be helpful because what happens is that Facebook tends to show only the active cameras. And so if there's about, you know, there could be 20 of us here and then Facebook would just make the whole world think there was only two or three of us. Now, why would we like that? Um, because having more people around tends to attract other people. And so um, if you can be fantastic. Now we understand that for some people, there's a bandwidth issue. So if you're unable to do it, that's totally fine. Um, we still get to spread the word of God. Um, and that's really the most important thing. But the human side of us will like to um, show people that there's more of us here than Facebook is, is showing. So um, if you can't keep it on at all and you can turn it on and off every now and then, I think that sort of helps in, in, in its own little way. Okay, so thanks for that. And also um, we'll expect questions, okay? Um, this is not a preachy type of Bible study. Um, we've done our best to make sure that it stays this way. It's interactive. We ask questions. We, you know, we um, throw the text out before the study so that everybody has enough time to go and look at the text and see what they can find. Um, so hopefully you have brought some things that you're going to share with us. And if you haven't, that's also fine. But in the future, 
we will encourage that you look into the text and find things that you can bring and share so that we can have, um, um, we can make that interactivity a possibility. Now, sometimes you may not have found anything, but you will have a question. Maybe there's a part, something you read that you didn't understand. Um, the questions actually help for those who are here who have some knowledge to also share um, for the benefit of everyone else. If you ask a question, lots of other people will benefit. In fact, the people who are not here with us will see our YouTube or our Facebook um, and then they will benefit. Also, I just wanna use this opportunity to quickly remind us that um, if you have not subscribed to our Facebook, um, sorry, our YouTube especially, um, I will encourage that you do that. Simply Hope My Ministries. Um, I will type it up in the window here for you. So if you just stop by and just subscribe, you know, that will be a kind of helping the gospel spread. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much all for coming. Um, I'll say I'll save the I love you to the end of the show. Okay, so we are in chapter four. We have read the text as usual. Um, we've come one step forward from, you know, the birth, the baptism, and all the stories that we've dealt with concerning the life of Christ. And now uh, we've seen the beginning of his ministry. We've seen the beginning of his ministry. So we have a few questions. I think about 10 of them, although I'm quite certain that by the time we finish, we'll have dealt with a lot more questions um, because this is one of those scriptures that's uh, super loaded. Actually, I should stop saying that. The whole Bible is loaded because we saw in the beginning that even the genealogy is loaded with meaning if you're, if, if you're uh, willing to study it enough. So our first question to deal with our first question to deal with has to do with Christ being led into um, the wilderness. And so what the text says is that then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Uh, so the question one would ask is, but why? Why? So we saw the Holy Spirit come down when he was baptized. And this is chapter three. Okay, now we're in four. So it's not that far apart. Why would the Spirit lead him into the wilderness to be tempted? Um, so I know we've all been doing some research, but Thomas uh, was indicating to me uh, about how much scripture he's got ready to be read today. So I'm hoping he'll have a lot to say on, 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 on the subject. Um, in the meantime, if you have something, please do share it with us. Um, so we have uh, a couple of theologians with us. Uh, so for Chair Mark, who is, uh, is a theologian, um, so for Francis is a missiologist, but in a sense, a theologian in his own right. Um, Sister Jemima there is in the deliverance ministry and has spent an incredible amount of time in the Bible. So we do have resource people in the house. Um, Brother Thomas himself is a very deep reader of the Bible. I've seen Sister Renika coming in. She's made several attempts. Somehow she's not, the system is not letting her in. So hopefully she'll be able to join us. So I we want to talk that. about, ah, she's in. Oh, okay. That's wonderful. Okay, so we want to talk about... Okay, so uh, we, we also have a very important guest who's joining us tonight. Um, may I introduce you to Reverend Felix Tete, who is um, pastor at ICGC. He heads one of the ICGC branches in London. Um, so he's joining us here for the very first time. He's a real big man. I'm surprised he's found the time to be able to join us today. Um, but he's a brother of mine that I have a great deal of respect for him. Um, he showed me a lot of love and handled me like a, a real senior brother will handle his junior brother. <laughs> so one of the few people who calls me to order when I'm out of line. So welcome, sir. Welcome to Bible Talk.
Okay. His mic is off. His mic is off. Okay, so that's the other rule here. If you're going to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself um, so then we can hear you. Okay, so we're tackling a question here and I'm looking for some answers. Does anybody have an idea about try. why? Marcus, I can try. Okay, please I go ahead. So I think Christ and his life um, give a model for us as Christians to follow. I think that's very fundamental. And yes. so some of the events are just meant to give us something to rely on. Now, they, they are meant to give us a model. Now I'll give an example. So someone challenged a man of God to do something. In real life, you know, I was there. He said, well, if you think your God is so great and he can do this, why doesn't he do that? And That's a good that one. Person, yes, and it was quite legit because we said we're living God, a powerful God, and that person challenged that person. And this was a very good model to rely on, to answer that person. That look, this is not the first time that Christians have been tested. Christ himself endured yes. this. And this is yes. how he addressed it. So I think that event, the Holy Spirit leading Christ to, um, to that place and being tempted, it's, it's something that we can use as a model for our own lives. And, um, yeah, that's what I think. Okay, so I, I and I, I totally agree with that uh, with that position. Um, but so, would would you say that God Himself arranges our temptations? No, I I don't think so. Um, again, I think God gives us. Um, he 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 would put you in a situation, but He gives you a window to overcome it. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, he wouldn't give you something that you cannot overcome. And so again, I think God, this is God's way of building us, building our resilience, building our yeah. belief in him and just giving us that strength as Christians. Okay. So um, he goes into the wilderness and then he gets tempted by the devil. I'd like to read um, some of what followed very quickly. Okay. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Okay, so I, I think that's the temptation that um, Brother Prince has just spoken on. Well, I mean, for the first one, we know that it was, there was three of them actually. Um, but what's, what does the text actually mean? What can we deduce from the text? Um, man shall not live by bread alone. This is the response that Christ gave. So the, 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 the sorry, I had to let somebody in. The temptation was that if he taught or if he was sure that he was the son of God, then he was to turn the stones around him into bread um, to eat. Why? Because he'd been fasting for 40 days and, and 40 nights. And um, if you fasted before, well, I think most of us here can barely manage three days. And so um, 40 days, so I see you say, I know they do about 40 days every, every once a year or something like that. So they're probably very good at this thing, but 40 days of fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, no food, probably no water as well takes you to a place where nothing matters in your existence um, beyond food. And I'm speaking from experience, not that I've been able to reach 40 days myself, but I mean, even one week would get you there. So can you imagine the 40 days? So Christ was at the point where 
nothing else should matter to him but food. Is that what you mean? I see your hand is up. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to say was that uh, first, uh, something about the invitation that was sent out. I realized that either you or Joy, it, it was the second time, it said something like the second time that Satan shows up to uh, towards the plans of God. And I just wanted to say that that wasn't actually the second time. Throughout the Bible, there are countless times when he had inspired other people to do it. But perhaps maybe when you say physically, then we, we could accept that. Then also when we are reading this text, uh, this one area where we, we have to remind ourselves that the chapter divisions and verses divisions in the Bible are man-made. So it's, uh, yeah. it's not that yeah. chapter three ends, then chapter four is read in isolation. So when you read chapter three and chapter four in together as it's supposed to be, then you realize that chapter three ends with God publicly affirming Jesus Christ as his son. So yeah. now Satan now gets the chance and he's going to uh, question him, if you are truly the son of God, then this is what you should be doing. So we see something that is, and which is even very prevalent in our days. Like I think was it Prince also made mention of his experience that mm. anytime, anytime uh, people would always want to redefine what Christianity is to should be to us. People would always redefine what the Christian life should be about for us. But then Matthew captures here what the spirit controlled life is supposed to be like. So when we talk about the spirit controlled life, that uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus. And the first thing that we see is he being tempted by Satan. So right here, we see something which goes against the theology of some people to suggest that once a person is of God, then nothing evil comes close to that person. Matthew They're free says, of everything. Yeah. Matthew here is saying that can definitely not be right. right. So I think you can continue. I, I was distracted. That's how come I'm not coming in with that. Okay. Okay. So that's so that's I think that's a that's a useful contribution. And let me let me emphasize that. Um the point you made about the separation of the text with numbers and chapters, if you like, and why how it is a man-made, um, it's a man-made thing. They're supposed to guide us and help help us find information um, more easily. So um, the original versions of the Bible didn't have those numbers. Um, so if you, and I think sometimes, and it, it also probably helps with the distortion of text because people then are able to go and lift something out of context and then use it to make a point that they wanna make. But if you read the larger story completely, you see that I mean, there's, there's a story that's actually being told and it has a certain direction. You cannot change the direction. So I think that's a very important point to make so that we're reminded every time we're reading this text that um, the numbers really mean very little. In fact, there's some kind of allegorism for want of a better word. So I, I know I'm guilty of um, verbosity when it comes to theology, but there's no other word for allegorism which is, you know, um, an allegorical interpretation of the, of scriptures, when people will take the numbers of specific chapters and try and deduct some meanings out of it and, and use that to make some point. Okay, um, does anybody have anything to contribute on, on the issue of the temptation? Oh, yes, um, I do have something to contribute on the part of temptation. Looking at the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 13, where it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. When I looked at this scripture and looked at the temptation of Christ, the temptations that Christ passed through were not the common ones that mankind goes through. So when mm. we see the scripture telling us to say, such which are common unto mankind, this was different, far, far different from the common temptation of mankind. Firstly, when you look at the fact that Christ had the authority and the power 
to turn a stone into bread, which you and I cannot do today. You see, so the devil can't even bother to say, hey, uh, can you turn this into this? He knows already your faith has beaten you down. So basically, these were not just common temptations unto man because Christ had the authority and he could definitely do all those things that the devil was testing him. So when I look at um, the temptation in this passage, I don't, I don't compare them to the temptations we go through because, you know, with greater authority, even the temptation will be greater. So you okay. find out today, um, when you look at certain temptations, like just bow down to me, worship me, then I'll give you everything. I'll give you the whole world. In our today's world, you find out to say people can even follow the treasures of the world without even being tempted. You know, they're mm. able to sacrifice just for them to have a better, you know, better position or something. So basically, yeah. when I look at these temptations, you know, um, it is a temptation to show us that no matter where we might be or the you know, ability or the blessings that the Lord might ever put on us, we should always find a way to overcome the temptations that come. Because we are human and mostly we are tempted with such things that are common unto man. I think this should really be an encouragement that we should always do our best to um, overcome temptation. So basically, I think that's what I would say before we go to the fasting. Uh, part Brilliant. Of, uh, Brilliant. So I'm 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 going to um well, so we, we have talked about it fast now, haven't I? And we've gone to the first temptation. So I I'm gonna read the rest of them. Um but before I go on, Sister Renika has given us a definition. Uh well it, so let me just read what she wrote. Temptation can be translated to testing, liking to our wilderness experience. Sister Renika, do you wanna? explain that a little bit as briefly as possible so we can dig in more we still have a lot of text to deal with um just briefly that is like i said like into our wilderness experience um like into the experience of noah like into the experience of what the israelites went through in their um, time when they were there. So if we can draw our memories back to the Old Testament and remember what the testing was back then for those people, we can pretty much put together with what Jesus was tempted with also. And again, like we said on last, well, like I said on last week's that this is basically to show us, like the scripture says that he went through everything that man himself um, ourself went through. That's it. Mm. So go ahead. Mm. Okay. So that's 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 a good one. So what you have succeeded in doing is to draw parallels between these other te temptations. Uh, sorry, the wilderness experiences that we've seen um, with what I call the patriarchs in the Old Testament and um, um, Christ's own wilderness experience. I think. Look, for would you say that uh, every Christian has a wilderness um, experience of a sort. Is that a real thing? Can, can we say that confidently yes. that yes. every Christian have had a wilderness experience? Yes, those experiences help us to grow in God and get more closer to him. Okay. Does anyone, anyone else agree to this? Have we all had a wilderness experience of a sort? Okay, uh, I, I maybe I cannot say wilderness experience, but then I do believe that as Christians, there are times that we all go through points of testing, and these are, I would say, even not just, uh, they are very regular. I mean, our whole life, when you read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says something that we have a high priest, but we do not have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but he was in all points tempted like we are yet without sin. And obviously he was speaking about Jesus Christ. So then it's an admission that as Christians, yes, there are times that we would be uh, buffeted by Satan. There would be points where we'll be 
tempted in, in ways like Jesus Christ was tempted, then there's, a, there's a, maybe a place where I would want to differ from where Thomas, uh, from, from what Thomas said. Yes, it's possible we may not uh, be asked to turn stone into bread, but then when you look at all these points of the temptation and you see that it was exactly the same model of temptation that Eve went through. And it's the same model of temptation that when you read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, 1 uh, John 2, 16, I should have opened it before. 1 John 2, 16 will say something like, uh, do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in this world are the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. So we see that every, uh, in almost every temptation, we are going to see a pattern like this. It's either something which is going to tempt us to satisfy our flesh, it's something which will be glorious to our eyes, desirable to our eyes, or it's something which is going to make us boastful in this life. And it's the same thing when Eve saw the fruit, the Bible says that she saw that it was something which was pleasing to the eye. And she saw that it was something which would satisfy her so much. And obviously, Satan has also sold a lie that it was something which was going to make, make her as wise as God. So for all of us, we would always be experiencing some of these temptations. We may not be asked to turn stones into bread, but uh, the, the only reason which would make me want to double up figures in the office is because I know that when I'm able to add some zeros, I may be able to buy the latest car in town. And then I'm, I'm going to get certain respect amongst my colleagues. Yeah, so in that case, I am appealing to the pride of life that is in me. The only reason why I would last after someone's wife is because I want to satisfy her upon my, upon my own passions, upon my flesh. So yeah. every temptation would have something hinging on that. So I, I believe that when we go and we pick each one of these temptations, we can examine where Jesus excelled and where uh, God expects that when we also tempted in a similar regard, we should excel. Thank you. Okay, so that's uh, um, very comprehensive. Okay, so let, I'm going to exhaust this whole te uh, text about temptation so that we can, we can finish it up properly and move on from there. Um, so we've seen um, the, the turn the stones into bread and the response was, it is written, man shall not live by, um, by bread alone, but on everywhere that proceeds from out of the mouth of the bed. This obviously assumes that there's a... There's a text that exists somewhere that actually says this. So we see that Christ is using scripture to respond to this temptation um, that was before him. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. On their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against stone. There is no way of rushing through this text because something very serious is happening here. So the first temptation was one kind of temptation, wasn't it? It was about bread. But the second one is slightly different. And what's interesting is that Satan actually quotes scripture and he uses it as the base of his temptation. So let's look at that again. So he brings a very basic standard temptation, which is, you know, um, physiological need, if you like, the food, the things that um, if you've been fasting, then food is the most important. thing. That's the most basic of all temptation, I think. Um, obviously, Christ's own is in a different class, but Bill is the most basic. And so when Christ responded with scripture and said that it is written that you shall not live by bread alone, Satan now turns to scripture and uses that as the base 
for his second temptation. Am I being correct here, Zofu J. Meza? Well, you are very much on point. Uh, and I, I, you said we are going to read through the three temptations before we comment. I couldn't because, I, this is when, okay, do you want me to read? I'll read two or three then. <laughs> okay. Because you see, this number two temptation is interesting because of the switch is coming from no scripture, seeing that um, Christ was quoting scripture. Now he comes into scripture and begins to use scripture as the basis. It's fascinating for me. Okay, third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I give you, I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. All these things I'll give you. He's standing on the top of the highest mountain in the world. Well, a very high mountain in the world. I'd imagine the, high, the highest one. All these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Okay, so three levels of temp temptations here. I'm especially fascinated by Satan's move into scripture and he, using it as a base um, for feathering his agenda. And I, I, uh, oh, okay. I think even with the, uh, maybe taking the first quotation, the first story temptation, what we see is uh, Satan obviously knew the scripture starts with right here. And in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 8, when you read verse 3, 4, it talked about the fact that uh, Moses was recounting when God was leading the house, the children of Israel out of Egypt and in the wilderness when they were hungry for 40 years. Instead of giving them bread, God made bread come down from heaven. Satan knows about this very well. And he appeals to remind Jesus Christ about it, knowing that he's God that, okay, this is what you did. Why don't you do it again? And that's where I was coming in with, uh, it, this was a temptation which was appealing to his flesh. Any person who has been fasting for 40 days definitely will be hungry. I, I haven't done that before, so I can't say for certain, but I know anyone who fasts for 40 days should be hungry. So yeah. once you appeal, to the flesh, to the stomach that gets, make bread. And this was something which was, Satan knew was very easy for Jesus to have done. So he appealed to him. Then uh, in, in the second temptation, uh, in the second temptation, what we see is uh, he quoting Psalm 91, uh, Psalm 91, I think 11 and 12, where yeah. uh, he had said that, for I will not let your foot hit the stone. And Satan is quoting this. Yet he put a twist on it, just like he did to Eve. But Satan yeah. was doing a night one. When we read Psalm 91, the idea that any person should come out with is that I should be able to trust God in every situation. Totally. But Satan would want you, you to walk away instead of trusting God by testing God. So God wants you to read some nice in, one. Indicating, indicating that you're actually doubting God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think it, uh, it, there is a phrase in there where it says, uh, I, I, can't, I can't reach my Bible now, it will, it will distract me. But then it's, it's very similar to his temptation of Eve, where he tries to put a stain on God, what God has said. Has, did exactly. God really say? Did God really, are you sure God really said this? And if you are someone yeah. who is not too certain of what God has said, then it's easy for you to doubt whether God actually said that. So for the, these first two temptations, that's how they come about. Then for the third temptation, just worship me. I'll give you everything, appealing to his eyes. All these beautiful kingdoms, all these glorious kingdoms, you shall have them. That's the reason why you came. I can give them to you. Yet he tells, uh, he reminds him that, 
when God was giving the commandment, the primary one among them, he said, I'm the Lord God who brought you out of the house of Israel. You shall have no other God before me. So here, what Jesus is doing is that we don't worship any God, any other God. Then we also don't worship any man. I mean, God is not supposed to be rivaled in the hearts of any believer. If anything, yeah. any person, anything, any other God gets the position of God, then you usurp the authority of God over your own life. Uh, thank you. Okay, so so I mean, th this is we 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 may need to um, stress on this particular thing a little because of, I mean, the bearing it has on what is happening today. Because it seems that Satan has not changed his method and his methods, he really doesn't have that many different methods. Like somebody says, he's not a very creative individual. Um, he has the same old method. So um, in Genesis chapter three, um, that's it. he did the same thing, okay? And that's what led to the fall. Like what he did with Eve was to get her to begin to doubt what God had said. Okay, if you if he can get you to doubt what God had said, then obviously you now become vulnerable and easy to redirect. And that's really what led to the fall of man, the estrangement of man, which made the coming of Christ a necessity in the first place. And it seems that he's doing it again with Christ. So let's remember this, though, um, that Christ is 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 regarded in a certain context as the second Adam. Adam was the first Adam, Christ is the second Adam. It is through the first Adam that we fell and the second Adam is the one who restores us back into that relationship that the first Adam originally had. So Christ was fixing the Adam failure and that temptation, that word twisting, and I'm, 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 I'm emphasizing on the twisting of the scripture specifically for a reason. It is the twisting of the scripture that led Eve, okay, to cause to well. Let's leave it out, leave Eve out, out of it because we understand by headship that Adam really was the one who's responsible because he really should have known better and he should have served the situation. He's the one with the authority, not Eve. But it was a twisting of the scripture. Satan saw in doubt, capitalizing on that doubt that he created to redirect God's children in, its, in a different direction. For me, this is what's happening in the church today. Well, not all of the church, but a lot of the church is doing that today. And if we don't understand, like we really need to understand the dynamics of this particular situation and the method by which Satan actually gets his victims. This is, we see him now doing the same thing with Christ. So first he comes, he does as usual, and then he, he, he digs into scripture and he says, well, well, you know, the Bible says so and so. And if you don't understand scripture enough, then obviously he takes you out of context. He gets you to believe something that's in fact the opposite of what it really is. And then before you know it, you're on a downward spiral. And that's the most common thing. Somebody was saying the other day on Facebook that um, it is not the lies that we need to be worried about. It is the near truth, the ones that sound like truth, the one with a bit of truth in it and um, loaded with lies that we should be concerned about. And Satan shows once again that he's, um, this is the method that he uses. So to be informed of, the, of uh, more inf be informed on this particular thing is to be a regular reader of the Bible, be a master of the Bible enough to see him when he's coming. Um, I'm sorry, I failed to recognize my brother Parker, who's you know taken some time off work to come and join us. Thank you for doing that. Um, every edition of the Bible Talk, brother Daniel is here. Um, like I mentioned, for Reverend Tete is also with us today. Okay, so temptation number three, um, you've dealt with, uh, with Mensa, but isn't that also important to kind of belabor a little bit? Um, is that the usual? Is that what he was looking for ultimately? If you will bow down and worship me, is that the same idea that threw him out of heaven in the first place and forced him to leave his original estate 
Um, is, isn't that what he's been looking for? Is that his final objective to get man, man to worship him? I mean, in order to get man to worship him, he has to estrange man from God. So as long as man was connected to the vine, um, he's not going to wither and die and become um, Satan's personal property so he can do what he likes with it. Um, a piece of wood is more difficult to burn when it's on the tree. When it falls off the tree, it catches fire rather quickly. And that's what Satan has to people um, who have been disconnected from, from, from God. Is this what he's been looking for, ultimately, that we should all worship him? Has he sought to be God? It's a question, people. Around temptation number three. Is that where he was headed from, from, from when he began his, his temptation agenda? Ultimately, to get Christ to bow down to him and worship him. Yeah, I believe so. And I, I was searching for this. Uh, I think uh, when you read Isaiah 14, I think Isaiah 14 verses 11, no, I think almost the whole chapter, it talks about what Satan uh, had always wanted, uh, the fact that yeah. he wanted to exalt himself to the, uh, to the position where God was or where God is. And it's never changed. And I think Satan, Satan's tricks are such that he never changes them. You ask whether he, is it that he's not smart? I think he's smart. One, it has never failed. Then there is no need changing the strategy. He does because this. Because it works. And, yeah, it works. So people would always fall for it. And we know how the human being, the, the, the heart which is not submissive to God, how that heart it's always uh, uh, the appeal. It's appealed. It's it's pulled toward uh, power, so that once you give people the chance to dominate other people, to to have power, because power comes with almost everything. It comes with uh, uh, money. It comes with status. Everything. So it's it's, a, it's that's also a definite tool that Satan uses to pull people and. As to how come he thought Christ would have fallen for this, I can't tell. But then I, I do believe that when Satan wants to tempt us also in this time, he does tempt us with power. And in our circles now, there are some things that because you don't you wouldn't know who it is before to share them. But then we know that in our circles now, even in the religious terrain, everything is about power. It's, it's about building. As a, a certain power which is able to even control government. I could mention names about some uh, religious empires now which are seeking to control uh, uh, government. And I'm not talking about Rome. I'm talking about uh, people who seem to have come from the Protestant Reformation. So it, it's something that we will need to watch out for. When we are, anytime we are tempted, we will need to ask ourselves these questions. Which aspect of my life is this appealing to? Is this something which is appealing to my flesh? Is this something which is appealing to my eyes because they are beautiful? Or is this something which is appealing to the pride of life so that I know that when I get this thing, it's going to improve my status in life or, or make others, others see me in a different regard? Uh, we, we would always have to examine ourselves on, on those grounds. Yeah, so I, I guess the ultimate, ultimate thing there is pride, isn't it? I mean, regardless of how you think about it, the things you want, all the wealth that you want to have, really is to put you in a certain position in comparison with other human beings so that you can be that person, you know, the one that everyone looks up to, sort of. And this is also one of the things, in fact, if it's not one of the things, I mean, the thing that he doesn't like at all, um, it's pride. Yeah, and this what actually fuels the teachings on prosperity. Yeah. On, on, on prosperity gospel so-called. That's what fuels yeah. it. 
there, there are some we... things that... Yeah, okay, sorry, go on. Yeah, and, and I, know, I know that you, we, we had a conversation on your program about prosperity um, or the prosperity gospel, if you like, recently. And um, are there any parallels we can draw? Is there something here that informs us on why that particular gospel, um, beyond you know the fact that it doesn't engender salvation, um, that some of this point as to the reasons why it is wrong? Okay, so uh, okay, I thought Thomas was coming to see. Oh, all right, brother Thomas, go ahead, please. Uh, I I didn't I didn't raise my hand though, so oh. you can yeah you can keep on. I saw you moving, so I, I thought you were just okay. Sorry. No, actually, right, I was so, just my charger. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So when you consider the prosperity gospel, one thing that it always appeals to, obviously, is, uh, is the fact that, like the word of faith movement, a man, can, a man has the potential to be whatever he, he wants to be. So that whatever you want to be, you can be. Whatever you want to get, you can get. And yeah. I believe that whenever a man is set on that plane, then it's... It, uh, it's very dangerous. It's, it's something which is very dangerous. It's anti what God expects of us. It's anti what God has made the Christian to be. And it clears, it's, it's something which is against the teachings of Christ. As we go through the book of Luke, I'm sure we are going to see the reasons why a person's mind should not be fixated so much on, on making and amassing wealth. Uh, like, uh, Matthew 6, 19, for instance, Jesus will talk about the fact that don't put your mind on making and storing wealth on, in this world because you are going to lose it. Rather, if you have any wealth making agenda, push it uh, towards heaven. Then it's, it's, throughout the teachings of Jesus, we see these things clearly coming up. So uh, it's, it's something that we would have to be mindful of, I believe. Okay, now can anybody um, chance an explanation to, or um, let's say conjecture, what could have happened if Christ had fallen for these temptations? <laughs> so Chairman mm -hmm. is holding his head. <laughs> I really, I really, really love that, that question, and it causes a lot. Um, it causes a lot of, uh, you know, how can I say? brainstorm because first of all if christ had fallen for any of those temptations first mm. it would destroy the name because he is the being who lived without sin yeah we were washed by the spotless blood of christ and he if if at all he sinned it could have come out as we are being washed by a spouted blood, like a blood that is not pure. So basically, something that has seen cannot wash something that has seen. It means our salvation could not depend on Christ. It means the Lord could have found another way to bring mankind back to him other than through Christ. Yeah. So if something like that could have happened, it could have been agony, but all in all, the Lord could have made a plan. So hmm. I see it as a very much, very much, um, you know, very tough challenge. It's a, it's a very valuable like, lesson, this. Sister Renika, um, please go ahead with your comment. I see that you have Isaiah 14, 13 to 14 um, posted. I was please just go ahead and make your point. I was commenting and adding to what the brother was saying. He mentioned that the whole chapter of Isaiah and I was just taking out the key scriptures from that chapter and it's um, verses 13 and 14 and it reads as follows if you want to hear. Hello? Go ahead. Okay, so I... Okay, 13. Go ahead, go ahead. It says, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the earth. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
that's 13 okay. and 14 that Excellent. So that's, that's it. So, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I don't really want to dig into this because you see, as human beings, we all have ambitions. And this is one of the most difficult things to talk about, because when you start telling people these things, they look at you like, okay, are you not taking this church thing too serious? But there's a certain pride that's hidden inside of ambition. Okay. And if you're not careful, so as a Christian, you're supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. And so what God wants is what you must want. And if you walk in the will of God, he is, because let's not forget, he has something that he wants to accomplish, which is the reason why he's created you. So he's going to try and do that through you. And we've seen this when we study the book of Acts, okay? So you don't particularly have an ambition. You are a vessel. Now, this does not mean in any way that you shouldn't want things or you shouldn't think a certain way as a human being. But your whole worldview must be revolving around this idea that you're an instrument in the hands of God. This will be the basis on which you will consistently go to God and ask for direction as to what you want, what to do at any given point in time. Now, I've tried to explain that in some writing um, by using Moses, for example, because Moses... Um, when I said that Moses didn't have any ambition, somebody, you know, was very angry and they argued with me. But the thing is, if you go back and you look at the text, you will see that Moses didn't have no plan at all of bringing the people of Israel to, um, to a promised land that he didn't know about. In fact, he hadn't even met God. But he, and even when God called him, he described himself as unqualified to carry out this mission. So this whole idea of I have a certain ambition to be, you know, something extraordinary. I want to be the next Bill Gates. I want to be the, it's a small problem around it that I don't want to be limbo in case I, you know, I, I, I get into trouble of people wanting to be rich. The Bible does talk extensively about um, wealth and the dangers around it. I think we've seen, we've had some of that conversation already, so I'm not going to push that agenda, but the example that Satan himself gives us shows very clearly that if you walk that, that, that path, it's, it's a real slippery slope. And if you're not careful, um, you might go down with him because you're ambitious. If you're ambitious, you don't, you barely wait on God. And when you go to God, you go and then you make demands of your own. You're not thinking in his will and not making yourself an available vessel that he's going to use to accomplish his will. It is not his will now. It is your will. Okay, that's not Christianity. Once it becomes your will, it is not Christianity. That's just you trying to achieve something and typically trying to get God to go along with you. Okay, um, we should move on. Okay, so the, with the difference between the temptations, I think we've talked about extensively. Now, is there something we can say, uh, or are there any parallels? I know also, which means that you talked about some of the temptations in the Old Testament. One that comes to mind very quickly is is um, is a temptation of Job. Um, that do, do do they have anything in common? The two. Oh. Uh, you give me some time to maybe okay. I can try that once. Okay, but Sister Renika, you also made a similar point, didn't you? About yes. temptation, temptation in the Old Testament. Yes, and the testings of the Noah and the wilderness. Yeah. And there's several testings that we can basically reflect on, on how we are to stand on God's word. I also agreed with you when you said about um, Moses. Also, Abraham was a person that basically was led. He, I believe he was the one that was tested the most in the Old Testament by the devil. You know, the enemy was study coming to father, presenting him, petitioning him, hey, do this with Abraham. He loves his son. Hey, do this with Abraham. He loves his wife. You know what I'm saying? So it yeah. was a constant testing to show the um, devil you know that I'm saying that Abraham, hey, this one is faithful to me the same way with Job. Hey, this yeah. one is faithful, even though yeah. they 
had some shakings in between. But like I said, when we are presented with that test, our response is the most important thing. It's not yes. literally the test because tests are going to come, but it is our response to how we react to that test. And we are to stand on the word of God wholeheartedly because the enemy is coming as the, in the Old Testament says, the enemy will come to testify the word of God against us. So if you yeah. are preaching that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and then the enemy will come and form a weapon right in front of your face just to see how you're mm. going to react to yeah. that test. And people usually run. I'm not telling any joke. I've seen people stand in church and say, hey, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And then the bill comes for a thousand dollars. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I'm fasting and I prayed and I tied. Father, why is this coming upon me? Stand well, on the so word there it is, of God. isn't it? It yes. doesn't really solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not laughing at the people, but I'm laughing at the situation because like I said, the enemy is going to come and test that word against us to how strong can you stand on the word as he did with Jesus. He testified yeah. the word against him and it was yeah. for Jesus to use the stronger sense of the word, the truth. And that's why it says the truth will set you free. Because if yeah. you know the truth of God's word, the enemy cannot come and snatch that word, as the parable says, when it is on the rocky ground, when it has just been planted, you know, the enemy cannot easily snatch it. So that is just my contribution to that. It's a wonderful one. Um, can we go to Joseph? Oh, yes. Yes. Him being thrown in the pit. Yep. And then, you no, know, and the, and, the many and testing. Daniel. Oh, my. Like I said, we can go through all the people in the Old Testament, and they will show us some form of testing that God gave them that they were able to literally stand on the word, even especially when it came to the fasting and yeah. worshiping and bowing down to that idol, you know, and then Nebuchadnezzar saying, I'm going to turn up the fire seven times i believe it says and then who yeah. ended up getting hurt amen it was the people. enemy yes yeah yeah so that that so that that i guess um, um brothers and sisters this establishes for us that if you're a bearer okay of um um god's mission so i'm using the word mission for a reason if you're a bearer of god's mission you are going to have to deal with the devil's temptation because his agenda is to make sure that you don't do um, um, what God has sent you to do. And when we say God has sent you, that's literally all Christians. He has made all human beings for his own purposes. It's like he wants to do things through all human beings. And some of us have rebelled and therefore cannot be available and not available to be used. But once you become available, you make yourself available for him to be used, then there is something on your hands that you must accomplish for God and the devil will not want it to happen. And so he's going to come at you. Many do fall. And you fall. And this is not say, to say that we are perfect in any way. I think Reverend Tati wants to say something. I shouldn't hold him. I was your mention. Let me go to Reverend Tati as he hasn't spoken tonight. Um, he's a senior man of God. And then I'll come to you. Reverend Well, yes. Your mic is on mute, sir. He, he may have to connect to computer audio. Okay. Connecting to audio, I see that's happening. Okay, so for Chairman, please go ahead with your point, and then if he's able to connect, um, he can okay, make his point. I think uh, my point was from where we just landed, and I, I wanted to go on about the fact that Yet it's possible uh, that there are times that we may feel in some of these temptations. And when you read the book of Hebrews, especially Hebrews chapter 11, we see a long list of God's faithful servants. And yet you look at, you pick any one of them and you see that these are people who at one point or the other would have failed in a certain regard. 
something comes to mind, uh, something killed at some point, yet he's recorded as a hero here. David, even King David also fell at a point, but he's regarded as a hero here. Abraham, yeah. the great father, also fell at some point, he was regarded as a hero here. And even some of the prophets and other people, as human beings, yes, uh, there are times that we would fail, but the great assurance that we do have is that when uh, I, I read this verse, Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, now I added 16, where it says, but we have this great high priest who is able to side with us in our infirmities in the sense that he has been tested in every way in which we are also being tested. The only difference is that with this great high priest, where, where we were tempted and we failed, he does not fail. And because he does not feel, he gives us the chance to come boldly before him for grace and mercy in our time of need. So we have this very calm, uh, calm and great promise of assurance from Jesus Christ that, yes, there are, there are times that uh, we would feel, even though we understand that for every temptation, God has made a way of escape for us and he's not going to let a temptation which we can't overcome to come back at us. Yet, yeah. if we think, we do know that we have Jesus Christ uh, as our high priest, as our intercessor, and we can go before him for grace and mercy in time of our need. So that, that's one point I also wanted to make. Okay. So I, so I guess, I mean, um, so what, you, what you're saying, what you and both, um, you and Sister Renika have said is that, these men that we're talking about were as ordinary as we are. Is that a good point to make? They were as ordinary as we are because we saw their failings. Exactly. But the one thing that they, yeah, exactly. stood, they didn't lose is their faith in God and standing on his word. And I think if we went back to Abraham, he became the father of faith because in spite of his, his failings, he still believed that God was the answer to everything. And that's really what's required of us. We are righteous, not because we have done anything right. It's because exactly. of the work. And I think that's Christ. also one point, that, one point too that we have to uh, take care of is that after Hebrews 11, after they had listed all the heroes of faith, you now come to Hebrews 12 verse one, where it says that seeing that we have this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us focus our attention on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. So, and for, for that reason, every time that we come to the Bible, we shouldn't make Abraham as our main person to, to, to fashion our life after. Neither David, neither Samson. These are all great people. They have their respect, they are heroes. Yet the person that we should be looking up to is Jesus Christ. So he's the less one and he's the person who initiated our Christian faith and he's the one who is able to bring it to completion as well. So that, that I guess cements the point that it is really all about the glory of God that if we achieve something it is because this is for us as believers if we achieve something it is because God has been has used us to accomplish a great deal. Do you recognize do you realize that actually takes a lot away from David who many people preach as a great hero who was the slayer of um, Goliath and the savior of, of Israel. Um, he gets a lot of credit for his strategy and his stones and what he could do um, and how we could all do the same thing and very little is said about what he himself said before he, he took on the battle. And the fact that he was taking on God's battle and not his personal battle, um, can you see the point I'm making, though? That it, it is, it, all these stories about these patriarchs and individuals are actually stories about God doing things and him using people to do things. And so no man actually deserves any credit that save the one that God himself gives him. Like when Christ said John, John the Baptist was the greatest uh, man born to a woman, that's Christ saying that. It is God who says that John the Baptist is great. You know, it is God who says that Abraham, um, David is a man after my own heart. 
You know, it's God who says that Abraham is the father of faith. It's God who's given these titles to men. When men begin to take on their own titles and to rob God of his glory, um, they're on a down, downward spiral. Um, so fantastic conversation, gentlemen. We have, um, where's Sister Joy? I don't know how we're doing on time. Hello, Marcus. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have about 12 minutes more. Okay, so we have 12 minutes more. Um, for the rest of the text, we see um, Christ calling the first set of disciples. And I think we may have to rush that very quickly. Um, this, is, this is a quick lesson that we can get out to that. And um, so let's go to the beginning of his ministry. This is after the temptation, right after the temptation, we see the beginning of his ministry. Okay. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon, Naphtali. This was to fulfill what? was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Again, we see another prophecy being fulfilled, okay? Um, this is necessary, isn't it? So that continuously, Christ is confirming who he is and the fulfillment of the promise that God made that he was gonna come into the world. Let's not forget though, that these story that we're telling are parts of God's promise to come to earth based on that happened and, and, and the result being man's estrangement and God seeking to reconcile man to himself and therefore coming down to the earth to sacrifice himself. That's the same story we're telling. This actually straddles the Old and New Testament. So we make a mistake when we separate the two like some, some, some have done in the past. And we see consistently that Christ is fulfilling prophecies in the Old Testament. In fact, I made a point somewhere about how um, Christ is, is, is the example for even the patriarchs. So he said before, before Abraham was, I don't know who wants to answer that. Before Abraham was, Jesus was. And if you look at the patriarchs, you can draw piles. You, the things you can pick out of their lives that will show you that these people were being Christ-like even before Christ had come. So it's not, you know, it's, it's really the same thing. It's the same story, it's the same message coming from the Old Testament and then concluding in the New Testament with the arrival of Christ. Okay, first disciples. Now, as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nest and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, immediately, they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Immediately, Peter and his brother Andrew left and followed him. Immediately, the sons of Zebedee left the abode, which really was their livelihood. It was their occupation. It was their vocation. They left it and followed it. Anybody want to speak on that? We're slowly running out of time. Real quickly, the other gospels yeah. speak about where this was not the first time that Jesus had met them. So if we read in the other gospels, for example, John 1, 3, yeah. I mean, 35, and yeah. I believe also in Luke 5 and 3, mm. it speaks to that. So, so they the, have seen not, the works of him. Yeah. So your point then is? You said that they left immediately. It's all, it was because they had already seen the works of him. So when they saw him, and I believe they said um, he called them. Exactly. So, so that's the point like, that I want to stress on. Mm. Amen. So it was exactly like, oh, praise God. You know what I'm saying? Praise 
um, whoever they had said father was, I just like to say father, praise father. This man, the Messiah, you know, has chosen us, yes, has called us. us. Amen. Yeah. Okay. And even though we're nobodies, we're fishermen, but there's something to be said about the immediate response and what they left behind, isn't there? Everything, yes, because the Bible tells us that we have not left anything that Father will not replace to us a hundredfold. And I tell yeah. people that's minimum. So if you're yeah. on this prosperity thing, then hey, I tell you, leave everything and follow God, follow Jesus. And guess what? It will all become, everything will be added unto you. Yeah. So um, we've seen how some people couldn't do that. So for example, the young ruler who went to see Christ and said he went to salvation because it is Christ who gives salvation. Okay, so if you go to Christ and you say you're looking for salvation or you're asking questions about how you can be saved, he says, well, give up everything and follow, him, follow me. And it's like, why? You know, so this is thing about <laughs> that obedience and the heart for God. And I, I, you know, for me, I will, um, someone who subscribes to Reformed Theology, I'll be quick to say that this has something to do with election and predestination. But, you know, seeing that some aspects of the Christian faith don't particularly subscribe to that theology, I wouldn't push that. But it shows you, because Christ himself says that you cannot come to him unless um, um, God himself has called you. So we kind of knew there are people who have a heart for Christ ready, waiting. Now there are people who, regardless of what miracles he did, so take Judas, for example, he walked with a man. He followed him because of a sinister intention that he had. Nothing Christ did impressed him enough to, to want him, to make him want to be right with him or to be, make him want to be faithful to him. And he finally sold him out. And so this says a lot about who Christ has called and who, who, whose heart is ready. I mean, I, 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 I see, I've see i seen this happen a few times when, um, so you take Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian, you know, for example, when a person's heart is ready and seeking God, you don't have to say much to them, okay? They, 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 they're ready, their heart is yearning. They, they inside them, they're godly people waiting to happen. And so you only really just need to drop, you know, a, a drop of water to get them to start flourishing. You know, and, and, and I think that these apostles who were called, they were that particular kind. They were ready. Um, honestly waiting, sincerely seeking, probably just in their heart. And so when the call came, it was an immediate response. Um, I'm just rushing through here because I don't particularly want us to come back to um, <laughs> Matthew chapter four again. So the four, I mean, yes, the first set of disciples have been called and Christ goes and he begins his ministry in, in Galilee. Um, and what did he do? He was going throughout all Galilee, teaching first and foremost. And I think people must remember this. Okay, in this same particular text, we saw that the first message he preached was about repentance. So, Renika, you made this point in a previous discussion, um, just like John the Baptist. Okay, um, when we saw Christ preach a message, it started with repentance. When John the Baptist preached a message, it started with repentance. When the apostles preached a message, it started with repentance and salvation. Really, that's all there is to the gospel. Okay, so you cannot go and preach a gospel and not speak on these things. Because if Christ will preach, it's about repentance. So we've seen that. Um, so in, in this portion of the text, it says he was teaching first. He, said, he was teaching first. And, and, um, and then, he, so he went to the synagogues and he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. It is only after the teaching and the proclaiming of the gospel in the kingdom before we sealing, I mean, we saw healing of every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Guys, I want you to take notice because I'm always telling people, you, you know what, you can go and seek healing all you want and you can go and, Ask God, you know, treat him like an ATM all you want. 
The one thing it wants you to have is the word. And if you have the word, you will see miracles. So you best follow the word. Just leave the money behind and follow the word. Leave the healing behind, follow the word. Because that's really what he wants to give you first. Also, it is the word of God that makes miracles. Christ himself is the word of God. That's what John, the, the early part of John says, that he's the word of God. And if it's Christ that's giving the healing, then you need to seek him. You need to seek him in his word. And he teaches you first before he heals you. Okay, guys, I'm just breezing through because we're, we're running out of time here and I don't particularly want to hold us here. Now, what happened after that? The news about him spread throughout all Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Okay, now I wanna talk about what we're taking away from this, this study. Um, you know, I would say that this study is loaded. I started by I started saying that earlier on and I changed my mind. Because in fact, every aspect of the Bible is loaded. And we saw that even in the genealogy, we saw what they represent and what they could lead to if you understood scripture carefully. And so no aspect of the Bible is a waste, even if it sounds like bad news. Okay. Um, if you take what seems like bad news out of its context and say, well, I saw this in the Bible and it's bad, and you don't get the larger story, then you're not getting it. You, do, you just don't get it. Um, what seems like difficult text in the Bible is not a waste. They serve a purpose. Um, and so it's, it's a complete um, book. It's all-rounded, and it has the key to um, our salvation. Let's talk about takeaways. Julia Mofolo, I see that you've changed your first name today to make it easy for me to pronounce. Thank you very much. I truly appreciate that. Um, is there something that stood out to you in today's study? Well, I learned that um, he uses things that will, I normally want to tempt me, so I must be careful. Okay. So if you're a woman seeking a husband, please be mindful. Temptation can come from that direction. Um, if you ask the money, please be careful. Temptation is going to come from that direction. Okay, uh, so Chairman is not at his desk. Let me go to my sister Chiwanza, who's a Zambian in Canada. Um, any takeaways for you, ma'am? Um, yes, many, many takeaways, but I think um, the biggest one was just. Um, the importance of knowing the scriptures because again, um, Eve was tempted in the same way. And in today's society, somebody who's saying one thing and sounds true, but those are half true truths. And like you said, those are more dangerous than just a blatant lie. So yeah, that was just my big takeaway and the importance of memorizing scripture. I think it's a real big one. Um, Sister Joy. Yes, I I think just to add up to what Shwanza said, it and what you have been stressing all this while is to know the word for yourself. Follow him, his kingdom first, and all other things will be added okay. onto you. Okay. Amen and amen, amen. So guys, before I come to the rest of you for the takeaways, can you see actually, so this, this is not going to stop, is it? Because the text is just the text, isn't it? Can you hear me, Joy? Yes, yes. I, I think my, my battery is very low, so. Okay. Yeah. So that's my takeaway. Go to the word, okay. the word always, and then. Now, can you can we all see why if the word is this important? Because we saw that it is the word that Christ used to overcome the devil. We saw that it is the word that creates miracles. We saw that it really is all about the word. Can we then see the importance of the word to the Christian and why it is problematic that a certain church did not 
want to make it available to everyday Christians. And people had to sacrifice their life in order to get the Bible out of the, that, those hands into the hands of every individual. It's a real issue. Why do I bring that up? Um, because it, the issues revolving around the Reformation. Welcome back, Reverend Tati. We were trying to get you to share a thought, and but we saw that you were having audio problems. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Carry on, please. Um, I, I, I'll do nothing with Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so basically, um, what, what I call, they said we shouldn't mention names, but mm. this one is inevitable. What, what, I, what I've always, well, it's not just me. I mean, this is not, really has nothing to do with me. This is the history of the church. And the history of the church says that the Catholic church um, did not allow Christians or believers access to the Bible. It was kept within the clergy and they told you what they wanted you to hear. And there was a lot of misinterpretation that was used for um, wrong purposes, okay? In fact, Luther, one of the, the um, most problematic statements he made was to call the papacy the seat of the Antichrist. Um, but we have seen in this study the importance of the word to the Christian and so the people who fought to make sure that we had access to the world. So let me put it a, a, a better way. The better way is the people that God used to release the word from the claws of the enemy into the hands of the everyday believer. Why must the everyday believer have a Christian? Because every Christian is a priest in their own right, is a prophet in their own right, and therefore must have access to the word and use the word to accomplish the things that God wants to do in their lives. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because this year, I mean, October this year is the 503 years, it's the 503rd year of the Reformation that has made us, all of us non-Catholics. Otherwise, we'll all, without the Reformation, we'll all be Catholics today. Um, and the news there is not good. So we are commemorating this Reformation um, that was I can say Martin Luther was the pivotal figure, but when we actually get to study the Reformation um, during our year, our conference this October, which is on the 26th, I think we'll see that there were many other people who started working towards um, this particular agenda, or I should say the better way. God was using other people. There was John Haas, there was the Waldesius, there was a host of other people who were fighting for this cause and fighting for the restoration of the gospel as it was, in the, early, in, in the early church and in, in, in the book of Acts. Um, if you've been here long enough, we've studied the early part of the book of Acts. So you saw how the church came into being and what the church was like. Um, in an article that I'm going to publish recently, I've made a point about Justin Martyr's description of the church in the early days and what church was like. It was nothing like what the Roman Catholic was doing. You saw clearly that the mass, the Roman Catholic mass was a pagan rite that was used to color what was um, church? Because the description we had of the church, uh, church service was nothing like the mass that the Catholic was showing us. There were no idols. There was no candles. There was no costumes. There was no um, altars of any kind. Okay, just people gathering together and and basically worshiping God, reading scripture, singing some songs, and then you know sharing as as they are led. So I, I'm, I'm using this opportunity to invite all of us on the 26th of October, um, ER, this month edition of ER, is about the commemoration of the, uh, of the Reformation. We think that's important, it's very important because for most Christians, the lack of understanding of the Reformation is responsible for their being misled. They don't know where the church came from. They don't know what has happened with the church. They don't know how they became non-Catholics. They don't understand any of it. They don't even know how they're different from Catholics. Um, to retell that story is to bring people to this understanding and to point them to um, um, places where they could research in order to understand their Christianity properly and be you know, better Christians. I think that's the reason God brings some of us together so that what we do can enlighten other people so that their walk with God will be strengthened. That's why we have pastors in this group. That's why we have theologians in this group. That's why you are here, um, because your contribution helps to push that particular agenda. That's not ours. This is God's agenda. All we do is to be make ourselves that available vessels that he can use to carry out this mission. So you've been invited. 
I will encourage you to invite someone. We'd like to make the, quite a significant event um, so that we can reach more people with that information. We'll share something. I'm going to publish two or three articles before then, and I'm going to be sharing them on our WhatsApp platform and on my Facebook page so that you can at least get some glimpse of it. But on the day, we'll be, we'll be making presentations on different aspects of the reformation and how it has influenced the formation of the church today. Um, Anybody else want to share a takeaway? Reverend, please give us a small takeaway, your takeaway from our today's our study today. Um, <laughs> well, it, it, it's a joy and, a, and an honor to be on the on the platform. I joined in late. I had huge problems with my phone. And um, okay. I, I just thought, let me just reboot and come back next week. But I just couldn't stay away. I just thought I'd just join you guys. Um, the bit that I caught, because I was obviously playing around with the phone, trying to get things right, but the bit that the temptation was a, a, a very important um, event in the life of our Lord and Savior. And um, um, it, it, it was um, without food, um, but with water. Um, yeah. When you, I know it was a comment you made earlier on, and uh, it, was, it was with water. And um, there's a reason for it. And um, I think that the temptation, when you look at it closely, it, it, it talks about the spirit, the soul, and the body. Um, we haven't got time to go into that into that much detail. But um, mm. without the word, as you said, we are swayed to think of things in a soulish context. So, which is what is happening now. We, yeah. we have to worship God in spirit and in truth. But what you find is that the soul is taking over, mm. carnality is taking over, uh, yeah. and um, we become superstars and become great authors. And I mean, you're an author, but um, mm. an author without it being Christ centered is just being an ordinary author. You just like Sidney yeah. Sheldon or any of those kind of guys. <laughs> um, you can run a business, but a business without being Christ centered, you just like Bill Gates. So I think the important thing is, is, is that we look at the temptation not because of the food that he didn't eat and the encounter that he, he, he um, had with the enemy. But what mm. we can derive from it is that our spirit man is, it, it, it will be attacked. Our soul will be attacked as well as the body, which was the main um, context of, of what happened. So um, just, I just want to just say that the take away from that is that let's go back to that portion of scripture let's not read only read it let's study it there's a lot yeah. in there there's a whole yeah. teaching that we can actually derive from that and i've, I've, I've actually done that teaching so okay. let's go and study it and um we'll be blessed by what comes out that's what okay. i'll say thank you very much for that may i introduce you to your fellow icgc member oh wow <laughs> <laughs> that will be that will be sister joy she's uh she's an icgc takradi i think Takari, okay. Is it um Pastor um uh Butri? It's yeah, Pastor Butri, okay. Yeah. She 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 is um a member of one of the big bosses, the presbytery members, the big the big guns. Okay. <laughs> right. Um that, that's good. I'm 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 in London, so yeah. Nice one. Okay. Everything so, of God. Sorry. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you as well, Joy. Nice meeting you. I'm 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 honored to be the the facilitator of your meeting. Okay. Um. Anybody wants to share a thought um on what we studied tonight, Abraham Addy. Abraham, are you there? Oh yeah. Um. Sorry. I. Yeah. I joined. I. I joined quite late. So I. I. I think about five minutes to wrap up. So I. I honestly didn't get the full thing. So. Um. But I mean, the few. Um. Uh, I mean, things that other people shared. Um. I think what are my take home is, to. Yeah. I mean, the Bible is the word, like Marco said. And the word is Christ. And I've been doing a lot of digging around and thinking and discussions about these things. And 
And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. Honestly, I'm open to uh, more knowledge. And that's why I keep joining these um, discussions. So, yeah, I think what my take home is to, yeah, still see the Bible as Christ and that's the word and to study it. The only, I got a quote from Marcos, which I'm going to take with me. I'm going to run with it. He says, every Christian is a prophet in their own right. So I'm going to run with that. And I'm sure I'll, uh, I'll meet him back door or backstage and then we'll talk about that further. <laughs> All right, so thank you. All right, so that's a, that's a good one. So for Daniel, I, know I see you're there. You haven't said anything today. Okay, so I, 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 we've passed our time. So um, I'm gonna ask someone to pray us out. Um, don't leave yet. We usually like to hang out and socialize after the event so then we can carry on the conversations in, in other ways. So um, does anybody want to pray for us? And then I will close the Facebook bit and then we can do our usual. Okay, so this house is full of people of God. Yeah, let, let us pray. Since okay. It has been long since I contributed. <laughs> 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 yeah, nice to see yeah. you. So usually, I, I usually come in when there is no power here, and uh, the time you are finishing, that's when power comes back. So this is when it has come back. God must heal Africa immediately. This power problem must go away. Oh, I'm telling you, we need Pentecostal prayers here. <laughs> Very heavily. <laughs> okay, pray for us, brother. All right. Let's pray, let's pray. Our Father God, we are grateful for this wonderful Bible study uh, we are able to, to have. Uh, Father, thank you for everyone you, you enabled to, to join us uh, this, this, this time. Uh, Father, we pray that the things that we have heard, uh, the things that we have seen uh, in your word, that Lord, may you give us the grace to put them into practice, O oh God. May you help us not just to be healers, but also to be dwellers of your word. Uh, Father, we pray that may this word uh, bear much fruits in our lives, O oh God. Uh, Father, we pray uh, that you may shape, shape us into the people you want us to be, O oh God. Uh, uh, each time we come uh, to, to, to listen uh, to your word. Uh, Father, we pray that you may help us to be people who bring glory and honor to your name. Father, now, even as we uh, dismiss from this meeting and do other things, and even for some of us who remain here, we pray that may your presence continue to be with us. May you continue uh, protecting us. May you continue, oh God, uh, watching over our lives, oh God. Uh, we are still, Lord, aware that we are in the period of COVID-19. We pray that may you continue to, to protect us, oh God, from, from that uh, uh, pandemic. Lord, we pray that may your name be glorified. May you receive the praise, the glory, the honor, and all the adulation. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we have prayed. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for amen. that. It's a wonderful prayer, um, Pastor Costa. Um, amen. So thank you very much. Um, again, I'm always grateful. I'm grateful, super grateful that you, find, you found time to join us here at the Hope My Ministry as we discuss the word of God. Um, God bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you. May he lead you according to his will um, to, to, to the great things that he himself has created you for. Um, I can never bless you enough. And may his eyes be on you and your entire household. Um, in Jesus' name. Thank you very much. And um, taking us off Facebook now.